Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the theology of Paul in our continuing study of the Pauline epistles. The traditional way of looking at Paul's message, especially his message of salvation uh, with regards to justification, is that Paul taught individual justification as God's work of grace in acquitting us, declaring us to be righteous uh, from our guilt through the substitutionary atonement of Jesus on our behalf. Luther taught that, Calvin taught that, a number of um, modern professors teach that, and I'm one of them. Um, I'm traditional when it comes to this perspective. But I want to show and point out that that's not the only way we can look at Paul's message. So uh, what we're looking at are some other perspectives. Now, it's not necessarily other interpretations, although some have taken uh, their perspective to be the only one. And, and there we have the problem. Uh, the What's called the new perspective, it's been around for quite a while now, so it's not quite so new. Um, and N.T. Wright, James Dunn, Ed Saunders are, are three of the uh, those that have uh, have um, spread this and taught this. Um, they haven't always said the same thing, so this is not necessarily a theology or even a single doctrine, but a tendency to look uh, to say that justification is primarily, and my issue might be primarily here, um, that it is primarily about the inclusion of Gentiles as a community apart from keeping the Jewish law. And then uh, they add probably a number of other things, is what I can fit on the chart, uh, that the final judgment will be based upon works. Well, let me take that apart. Um, first of all, I might have a problem with primarily about the inclusion of Gentiles, because I agree that justification is about, to a certain degree, about the inclusion of, uh, inclusion of Gentiles as a community apart from keeping the law. That part is true. Is it is that to the exclusion of individual justification? I don't, I don't believe that it is. Uh, so that new perspective becomes erroneous when it becomes the only perspective there is. Um, now, the question of the final judgment, will, will it be based on works? Actually, uh, if you look at every prophetic statement about the final judgment, not about how we're, we are declared righteous right now, but about the final judgment, then yes, uh, that's always maintained, it's always stated that that's on, on, on the works, their works will be judged. Um, now, you, how do we take that and, and reconcile that with uh, individual individual justification by faith. I think we can do that in the same way we can reconcile the words of James and the words of Paul with regard to uh, how is a person justified, that one uh, comes about as a result of the other. Um, but I don't, I don't think those are necessarily at odds. I think they've been made at odds, especially when you look at the, the writings of those three men that we mentioned. Uh, but I want to also look at, at two other perspectives. The apocalyptic perspective sees Christ, uh, that Christ is God's unexpected incursion, unexpected by us. It was expected by the, by the prophets. He was prophesied. But it is God's unexpected incursion into human history f to rescue people and eventually the entire cosmos from the powers of of sin and death. And of course, that's not denying final judgment, but that that God has come in and he's changing everything. And again, I think that's part of the story. And I don't have an issue with seeing that. Now, that's that's part of what Paul says. It's not, it's not everything that Paul says, but it is part of what Paul says with regard to uh, God's work. Um, he doesn't really link that with justification, but his work of redemption, think about Romans chapter 8, where the entire um, the, the entire universe is, is bound up, uh, waiting for its final redemption. And then finally, what we could call the anti-imperial perspective, that Paul presented Christ rather than Caesar as the true Lord and the Christian community as an alternative to the oppression of Rome. Um, again, I think that's part of the story. Now, I think we have a problem in each one of these cases if we say that's all there is. Um, so it's a little bit like, I'm going, going to use that old illustration of the, of the blind men and the elephant, where each one uh, feels a part of the story, and they, they say, well, the elephant's like a tree because he's feeling the legs, or the elephant is like a snake because he's feeling the trunk, uh, or like a palm leaf because he's feeling the elephant's ear. Um, and so I think that, um, as I said, I'm a traditionalist, and so I probably default in that direction.
Um, but that's part of my Western heritage, because remember, in the West, we're very uh, individualistic. But Paul actually makes the gospel both collective but also individualistic if you look at the language that Paul uses. So, so he does both, even though he's dealing primarily with a more collective society than we are in the West today. Now, next I want to look at the question of two kingdoms. Uh, and I think this applies to some of those perspectives that we were looking at just now. Um, remember that Paul in Romans chapter 13 calls for re- obedience and submission to local earthly governments. He's very clear that that every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, um, that, that those powers that exist are ordained by God um, that God has ordained governments and, and he has established them. It doesn't, that does not mean that there are not un, unrighteous governments, but that we are to obey the governments unless that government orders us to do something that is against God. For example, if the government says, uh, from now on you're going to worship idols, and we say, well, we, we can't do that. Um, doesn't mean now that we break every other law that that government gives, but we break the unrighteous law taking a stance for God, because there's a higher law, there's God's law, that is in effect. And and so Paul really lays that out in Romans chapter 13, verses uh, 1 through 7. He, um, he gets down to verse 7, he says, Render to all men what is due them, uh, tax to whom tax is due, which sort of reminds us of what Jesus had said, pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar, to God the things that are God's. And that's the balance. That's the balance, that we are to pay to Caesar, the obedience and submission to local earthly governments, but we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. We have a higher uh, calling, and so we obey God when there is a conflict between the two. One is temporal, the other is eternal. We understand that. Um, But remember verse 7, he says, uh, render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And then he continues, although it, in, in one sense he's going to a new subject, but this is still tied to, to what is previously. Uh, he says, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. That's part of our love. We are to love as God loved. Remember how God so loved the world and God sends rain upon the just and the unjust. And in that sense, we are to be good citizens. Uh, that is, that we're to pay our taxes and we're to uh, ob- observe those those um, good things and, and even those things that we might not care for, but they're not calling us to do something evil so that we are to pay, uh, as it says, tax to whom tax, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So that if you're in a courtroom and the judge walks in and the bailiff says, all rise, then you should rise. Um, That's appropriate. That's not against God's holy order. Next, I want to go to the question very briefly of the church, uh, the question of the church and Israel. Now, we address this in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, uh, but I want to address this in regard to what Longdecker and Still uh, said in their book, Thinking Through Paul. We've been using that as our textbook. Um, They present what they call the two ways view. Uh, that that Paul's gospel was only for Gentiles. Now, that's a very minority view. I don't really see too many people holding that, but I have run into one or two uh, that say that Paul's gospel was for Gentiles. He meant for Jews just to sort of go go their own way. Well, no, uh, Paul and the New Testament church were both unified that we should all, that we should all come to Jesus. There's no other name given among heaven by which he, he, we, might, we must be saved. That Jesus is the Messiah, and we must all recognize him as such. Uh, however, here's the question, um, when it came to things like keeping the law and circumcision, Paul is very upfront. He did not tell the Jews, don't circumcise your children. He did not tell the Jews, no longer keep the law. No, if they had, if they were, if they had grown up keeping the law, then he says, well, continue doing that in whatever way you came to the Lord, continue in that way. Now, if you were a bank robber uh, before coming to the Lord, he's, he's not saying go be a bank robber. Or if you were an idol worshiper, no, you were saved from that. But with regard to those observances, he doesn't insist that Jews must now stop their observances. Now, notice the the far end of the other spectrum of this question is what has been termed replacement theology. 
uh, stating that Christians have replaced the Jewish people as God's chosen people. Uh, and um, this is often taken when we, when we notice how that certain things that were described of Israel, that Israel was God's chosen people, uh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, and those descriptions are now applied to the church. And so it's, it, it's, we look at that and people say, well, they, we must be replacing Israel. Uh, with regard to God's chosen people and the and the promises of the Old Testament. Um, and we pointed out when we were looking at Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, um, that instead God has used the unbelief of Israel as an opportunity to graft Gentile believers into his people. Remember, the church was, at the beginning, was exclusively Jewish. That... Um, that as we look at the what we could call the birth of the church, that's actually a remnant of those who were believing what God had said about his Messiah and then recognized that Messiah was there in their midst, that that was God's chosen people who had done that. Uh, going all the way back to the Old Testament, it was always God's chosen people, Abraham and Isaac. But now what has happened is that Gentiles have been grafted in to what was largely Jewish. Now you say, well, Abraham wasn't Jewish because there was no, no Jewish, that, that term wasn't there. there. There were no Israelites. They came from Abraham, not the other way around. But still, the promise had been given through Abraham, and we become, according to Paul, we become Abraham's seed as we are connected to the one that was promised as Abraham's seed. N not seeds plural, but seeds singular, as we are connected to the Christ, the Messiah, to Jesus. And so, uh, God has used, it's true, God has used the unbelief of Israel as an opportunity to graft Gentile believers into his people. And if he grafted uh, we who, who were by nature a wild plant into this cultivated plant, then how much easier is it to graft um, those who are physically the descendants of Abraham, th those who are physically Jewish, those who are physically Israel, how e much easier it is is it to graft them in. And Paul is actually hopeful that that is taking place. And, and indeed, I, th I think on, in a limited sense, uh, I can think of a number of Jewish Christians, people who have been regrafted. Maybe they weren't uh, brought up as Christians, but they came to understand that Jesus is the Messiah, and they've been they've been grafted in and and fit quite nicely. Um, I think fit maybe more nicely than than we Gentiles do, uh, because that's part of their cultural heritage. Finally, I want to look at the nature of the atonement, and. The atonement is both sacrificial, I'm going to have a number of terms here. Um, of course, when you talked about a sacrifice, uh, that was something that was all throughout the Old Testament. So um, it's, it's very Jewish in that sense, although it goes back to even before uh, Israel or before Abraham, going all the way back, I think, uh, to the Garden of Eden. Think about how, how uh, Cain and Abel, and, and Abel takes of the firstlings of his flock and offers them uh, as a sacrifice. So the sacrificial idea I think goes all the way back to the very beginning. In fact, I would suggest it goes back to the day in Genesis chapter 3 when God made coats of skin for, for the man and the woman who had sinned. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 describes Christ as our Passover who has also been sacrificed. So the atonement, what Christ did upon the cross, was a sacrifice. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2, Paul says that Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Uh, remember that the, the sacrificial system was something that you, you took and you saw and you even smelled. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and there's a sense in which there's a delightful fragrance to what Christ did on our behalf. Secondly, the nature of the atonement, it was both sacrificial but also vicarious. Now, that's not a term we use a lot. Uh, by that, we mean uh, that he was our legal representative, and, and we get that from Romans. But think about uh, that term vicarious. Um, you know, oftentimes you'll maybe not go, but you'll watch 
a football game or some other sporting event where you particularly identify with one of those teams. And so uh, they won a victory, and you think, well, we won a victory. Well, you didn't do anything. You were just sitting and watching it uh, on the television. But you you vicariously, it's almost as though, though they were in your place as your representative winning that victory. Likewise, we had both one who represented us at the very beginning of creation. We had the first man, Adam. Um, And yet, when we come to faith in Christ, he has become our legal representative. This is Romans chapter 5. Uh, that we've we've talked about it on a number of occasions, where in the same way that Adam sinned and all humanity then were were reckoned to have sinned in him, so also when we come into Christ, when we trust in him, when we when he becomes our Lord, our Savior, our representative, uh, his death uh, is considered to be, to have been our death. He died in that place as our representative and we are connected to him, and so the atonement uh, has a vicarious note to it. Romans chapter 5, verse 18, uh, So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. He goes on, verse 19, For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, that is, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Next, the nature of the atonement is such that it is substitutionary, that he was our substitute. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, remember he's speaking to Gentiles there, um, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Verse 14, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. That is, the debt that we owed. The sins that we committed, it's as though they were nailed to his cross, that he died in our place as our substitute, so that his his the death that Christ died was both sacrificial, vicarious, but it was also substitutionary. Next, it was penal. Now, when I say penal, think about the term penalty, that there was a penalty that was demanded. And so Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul says that Christ, by the way, notice these are all from Paul. We're talking about Paul's theology. Uh, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The penalty for our sins, he took upon himself, he took our curse, the curse that we deserve, the curse from our covenant breaking because when you when you broke a covenant the result would be that you would um, you would be cursed the old way that a covenant was seen in, back in the uh, in the Old Testament was that you would take an animal if you were do, going through the physical uh, way of illustrating it you'd take an animal and you would kill the animal and then you'd cut it into and the the participants of the covenant would pass between the pieces and what you were saying was that if I break my part of the covenant, my part of those covenant stipulations, then what happened to that animal, may that happen to me. You were actually putting a curse on yourself, saying what happened to that animal, that should happen to me, where I might be torn apart and killed. Well, Christ took that curse upon himself. His death, notice, he redeemed us from the curse of the law as he became a curse for us. So he suffered our penalty. Next, it was propitiatory. Now, that term propitiatory, remember propitiation is is to satisfy the just demands of the law. Uh, Romans chapter 3 3 and verses 24, 25, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a, here it is, a propitiation in his blood. Uh, That is a satisfactory payment wherein that the the demands of the law that were against us, that we had failed to keep, those demands were met and kept in the person of Jesus, notice, in his blood, uh, by his death upon the cross. 
Now, that term propitiation, if you, look, if you were, had been allowed to go in, and you wouldn't have been allowed because only the high priest could, could do this, but into the tabernacle where you had the Ark of the Covenant, picture it here, uh, this, uh, this box that had on the, uh, the top of it these statues of two cherubim facing each other, and uh, the lid of that Ark was known as, in Greek, as the helasterion, we say the mercy seat. The word seat isn't actually there, the place of mercy. But really a better rendition might be the place of propitiation, the, the place where the demands of the law are, are met. And it was here that once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle blood uh, onto the, to, to the top of the mercy seat. Notice there's a space there. That space was considered to be the very throne of God. And so blood was brought at, to, to appease the wrath, the, to appease the just demands of the law of, on behalf of the nation. And of course, um, Paul used this term that describes that, that pictures that, how Jesus has paid the price for us has satisfied the requirement of God on our behalf. The nature of the atonement, it is sacrificial, vicarious, substitutionary, penal, propitiatory. Um, that, that propitiation presupposes anger, the just demands, but the price of propitiation on our behalf was death. So we've already seen uh, Romans chapter 3, verses uh, 24 and 25, that it was in his blood, through faith that he was displayed publicly as a propitiation. Next there is, next there is the nature of the atonement, that it is expi uh, expiatory. Now, that's a, another term we don't use a lot, hardly at all, um, that it removes guilt. Um, and in this sense, uh, we can take propitiation and expiation and cost, contrast them together and maybe see how this plays out. Propitiation is to appease or satisfy the just demands or satisfy anger, satisfy wrath. Uh, expiation is to erase or to remove guilt. In propitiation, is directed toward the anger or the demands of God. In expiation, is directed toward the guilt of man. Sort of two sides of the same coin. Uh, they are related. In propitiation, the sacrifice in the temple appeased the just demands of a righteous God, but then in expiation, notice it covered the guilt of the sins committed. So uh, these really are two sides of the same coin. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, uh, beginning verse 25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her having cleansed, and notice it's the cleansing that removes, um, that removes the guilt, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So the nature of the, the atonement was that it served to, to remove guilt. It served to cleanse. Next, it was redemptive. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. That, that purchase idea, we have been purchased uh, by the death of Christ. And finally, that the atonement is triumphant, that it accomplished what it set out to do. Um, we see this triumph idea in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of knowledge of him in every place. Uh, we see it also. Also in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, that's the language of a triumph, having triumph over them through him. That his death upon the cross was not a failure. To the contrary, it was a triumph. So that we hold that the atonement is both sacrificial, vicarious, substitutionary, penal, propitiatory, expiatory, redemptive, and triumphant. That it is all of these areas. Now. Each one of these presupposes something, and we'll end on this note, that the sacrificial nature of the atonement presupposes that the animal sacrifices were, were inadequate. 
that that our sin could not ultimately be handled by the death of an animal. Sort of obvious to us, not so obvious to those from the Old Covenant. That it was vicarious, that it presupposed man's sin uh, and man's identity with sin, and so both our act of sinning, but also the, the the idea where we have a representative who was at odds with God, uh, we needed one who to be in our place, one to connect us with the Father. Thirdly, that the substitutionary idea presupposes man's inability to save himself, that we needed a substitute who could do and accomplish the work for us. Um, so he is our substitute. The penal or penalty uh, idea behind the atonement presupposes that there is a penalty that we deserve, <laughs> an infraction for which we, or infractions plural, for which we are liable, and he paid the penalty on our behalf. It pre- the propitiation presupposes God's anger and wrath and just demands of the law against us, uh, that we have broken the law and are deserving of those things. And notice how that's linked with the, the penalty idea. Um, the expiatory work presupposes guilt that needs to be removed. The redemptive presupposes that we were enslaved to sin and needed a release from that. And finally, the triumphant work of Jesus on our behalf, on our behalf presupposes a conflict, a cosmic conflict, in which he has won the victory. 